G'day, in this video we'll be talking about sulfur. Sulfur as the main driver of quality in a way um, and its importance in a lot of our agricultural systems. So if you haven't already seen, we're running a regenerative nutrition management series. Go check it out, it's completely for free on either YouTube as a uh, under our playlist section or you can head over to our website. We've written everything up that we've talked about in each of the uh, nutrients in their, in their uh, blogs. Uh, and you can see all of them together as part of a course. So completely free, there's not even an email opt-in, which is pretty cool. But anyways, sulfur. Now, sulfur is pretty interesting. It's one of our last macronutrients that we'll be talking about uh, in this course. Now, sulfur is quite interesting because it's a anion, which means it has a negative charge. And we'll talk about what that means in terms of our soil uh, just in a moment. But there's really three main functions of sulfur. The first one is the formation of two amino acids that contain sulfur. That's cysteine and methionine. Now cysteine is uh, very important for the folding of proteins. So what this looks like is after amino acids are put together into a polypeptide chain, you'll have cysteine along there somewhere. Let's just say this is our uh, polypeptide chain. And we have cysteine here and cysteine here. What cysteine wants to do is come together. And so you get this folding of our uh, polypeptide chains so that the cysteine can be together. What this causes is the folding of protein. And the folding of those proteins give the proteins the actual function. And so cysteine is super important for the folding of different proteins. And so without cysteine and therefore without sulfur, you, you get these incomplete proteins that don't really do anything, they're, they're incomplete. And so they're a bit problematic. So you want cysteine to be able to fold these proteins into their complex shapes because that's what gives them their functions. Now, the other amino acid is methionine. Methionine is the, the first amino acid in every single protein, it's a, it's a start codon. And so without sulfur, you simply just don't get proteins. You don't get methionine to start off these polypeptide chains. And that's super problematic because when we want to convert nitrogen into amino acids, we need sulfur in the plant to be able to create methionine. So hypothetically, we could have a heap of nitrogen in the plant and we could actually convert it all into um, glutamate, which is the first amino acid that nitrogen gets converted to. But if there's not enough sulfur for that glutamate to then get converted into methionine and then cysteine, um, we just end up with a bunch of amino acids. We don't get to produce proteins, which is what we need for um, pest resistance. So it's important that we have sulfur at a very particular ratio. Now, it's somewhere between uh, 10 to 15 to one. So that's 10 to 15 nitrogen to, to one sulfur. And now typically we like to shorten that to a 10 to one just so that we're hitting our sulfur requirements. What this allows is enough sulfur in the plant to convert all of that nitrogen into either a cysteine and a methionine and then amino acids, so super important. The other thing that sulfur is quite important for is volatile sulfur compounds. Now these drive a lot of flavor and um, aromatic uh, properties of a lot of our plants. So if you think of garlic and onion and brassicas, they're the main kind of three, and as well as every other plant, but those three, but they're examples of plants that have a higher um, production of these volatile soft compounds. These are super important, not only for flavor, but also plant defense against pests and disease and herbivores. And so the plant can use sulfur in the production of these, which can be used as uh, defense. So sulfur, is important for uh, defense of the plant. And so as outlined by uh, this fantastic book, Mineral Nutrition and Plant Diseases, sulfur is super important, especially for uh, resistance against fungal diseases. And so sulfur causes something called the sulfur-induced resistance of plants, and typically that's, that's powerful against fungal diseases. And that's where the application of sulfur can really upregulate the ability of the plants to defend itself against uh, uh, fungal pathogens. Now sulfur requirements for different crops vary uh, a fair amount actually, just depending on the amount of these volatile sulfur compounds. So grasses are quite low, they still need to produce uh, cysteine methionine, but not so much these volatile 
uh, sulfur compounds. Legumes require sulfur uh, actually in a fair amount for the formation and the development of their nodules. And you'll learn all about sulfur requirements for nodule development in our How to Boost Nitrogen Fixation Legume video. If you go check that out. But more specifically, brassicas. Brassicas require a lot of uh, sulfur for these compounds. So if you think about going through a canola paddock, and so it typically smells like what you'd associate sulfur with. Now, that is because these volatile sulfur compounds um, and brassicas produce a lot of them. And so brassicas require a lot of sulfur to do that. Now, currently in Australia, because we've moved away from super uh, towards more map and dap, we tend to be running a deficit of uh, sulfur in terms of um, our agricultural practices. So we're not adding back the sulfur to our paddocks. So there's some potential massive yield penalties for sulfur deficiencies in our brassica crops like canola. So it's super important that you pay attention to this if you have canola. So they're kind of the main ones, um, the main functions of sulfur. Really it's in mes uh, mes mesistane and thymidine, especially when we're looking at converting nitrogen into complete proteins, super important. Um, but also for this quality, kind of like, like that flavor and plant defense. And so when we consider sulfur in the soil, typically we find a lot of our sulfur inside soil organic matter at that ratio of 10 to one. In soil organic matter, uh, that sulfur can then mineralize into sulfate. And sulfate is the form that our plants pick up. So it's SO4 with a negative two charge. The interesting thing of this sulfate is that it's highly leachable. And so it doesn't really cling to anything. So if you're in a clay soil, it doesn't necessarily matter. So unlike the ability for clays or soils to hold onto cations with the cation exchange capacity, soils typically don't have the ability to hang on to anions or negatively charged particles, except for the fact that soil organic matter has positive charged sites. So because sulfate is negatively charged, it can only hang on to positively charged sites in our soil. And soil organic matter is the only th thing that can actually provide those positively charged sites. So soil organic matter, super important because it has both negative charged sites for our cations and positively charged sites for our anions. So that's things like nitrate, sulfate, as well as our phosphates. Sulfate can hang onto soil organic matter as well as be inside soil organic matter, which can then be mineralized to be released into uh, the sulfate on the outside of the soil organic matter, but also in a soil form as sulfate just in the water solution. What's difficult here is that this form is highly leachable. So once it's in that form, in areas where you get a lot of rainfall, there's a good chance of uh, potentially losing the sulfur or sulfate from leaching. And so that's why, and we'll talk about this in a moment, one of the man management strategies for increasing the our sulfur component within our soil is increasing the amount of soil organic matter. So when we look at our soil tests, what we want to be seeing is typically somewhere in the ballpark of, in terms of our available sulfur, which would be a combination of these two things, somewhere in the ballpark of eight to 12 parts per million. So 12 being more in that clay soil and eight being more of a sandy soil. Um, and then because we get uh, totals done, which considers this soil, this sulfur in our soil organic matter, that's more looking at 100 parts per million plus. So if we can get a, past 100 parts per million, that's an excellent point to be for our total sulfur. Now typically you might want this a bit higher, uh, just to add a bit more sulfur if you're gonna have a um, brassica crop growing in or a uh, legume crop. You should look at the critical values for each of those crops that you're gonna put in to make sure that the amount of sulfur in your soil is going to achieve maximum yield. But say you're running a bit low on sulfur in your soil, what are you gonna do? There's kind of two strategies that we like to use. The first one is to, that typical build up and soil applied. So there's really three main fertilizers you can use and there's variations of within each of the fertilizer, um, but these are the main categories they fall in. So gypsum. Gypsum is probably what we would prefer in part of a soil amendment program. So gypsum as well as potentially dolomite or lime and compost. And that's gonna provide about somewhere between 12 to 18% sulfur. So that's a really good way to get sulfur into your paddock. You can pair this in with a bit of lime or soft rock phosphate or dolomite to increase your um, pH. 
Trypsin itself won't increase the amount of pH in your soil. It will provide calcium, but it won't fix your pH. Uh, elemental sulfur, on the other hand, will lower your pH. So this is effectively like just straight sulfur. 85% sulfur or greater than 85% sulfur, it can be used in clay soils to then lower the pH. So say it's at a pH of eight and you wanna lower it towards that six and a half percent, elemental sulfur can be an option to assisting with that. Now, I think as a way to, to lower your pH down to five and a half, it can be pretty expensive, but to provide sulfur, I think it's not a bad idea. The other thing is super. Now super used to be where we got the majority of our uh, sulfur, but with the move towards map and dap, uh, we're losing that sulfur source. So about 11% is great, adds a bit of uh, phosphorus as well, which is quite beneficial. And then uh, ammonium sulfate. That's a uh, excellent source of both ammonium or nitrogen as well as sulfur. And that's about 24% sulfur. So it really depends on what you're going after. If you want a bit of calcium and you're applying say lime as well, you can add that gypsum to get that sulfur in there as well. You're already making the application. So if you add a couple of hundred kilos of gypsum to your application, there's pretty much no not much more additional spreading cost. You just got to get it there. It's also a cheap form of sulfur, so it's really good. Uh, super if you need the false, elemental sulfur, uh, potentially, and then ammonium sulfate if you need the nitrogen. Now, ammonium sulfate is an excellent way in a foliar application. So if you're gonna add, say, uh, urea, you can add some ammonium sulfate to achieve that 10 to one sulfur, uh, nitrogen to sulfur application in your foliars. And you want that 10 to one so you can hit the methionine and cysteine. The other options for sulfur in our foliar applications is magnesium sulfate and potassium sulfate. So mag sulfate about 14% and potassium sulfate at 18%. I would only really consider these if you really need magnesium or potassium. Otherwise you might as well use your ammonium sulfate to get a little bit of nitrogen. Now of course, this all depends on what your differential substance analysis says, as well as what your um, soil test says. But again, these are kind of the main forms for foliar applications, and these are the main forms for uh, soil applications. And we'll talk about how to optimize that in just in a moment. When it comes to that differential substance analysis, again, we're looking at the 10% uh, deviation between the older leaves and the younger leaves. Sulfur uh, is quite immobile, so it, it won't move from the older leaves to the younger leaves, which means if we don't get a flow of sulfur uh, from our soil in, into the plant, then we'll come up with a, with a deficiency. So we're looking at about a 10% variation between our young and old to tell us whether or not we should be applying a foliar application. That might be typical when uh, the soil starts to get colder or dries up a bit, because this process of where the soil organic matter releases into the soil solution is driven by microbes. So when it starts to get cold and dries up, microbe activity uh, reduces. So we want warm and wet conditions for those microbes to really be active. Without that, we're likely gonna be running into deficiencies. So when it comes to our regenerative management, what we wanna do first is make sure we actually have enough sulfur in our soil. There's no point in just going down this foliar application. Foliar application is only a band aid fix to our soil in the meantime. So we really wanna be getting our soil applications of sulfur up. The best way to do that is, is with our gypsum in a soil amendment program. If we are going to apply gypsum, what I'd highly recommend is add compost or a carbon component to our application. So. What this allows is effectively this system. So if we're only applying gypsum to sand, gypsum is going to dissolve and that sulfur is just going to run straight through. So adding a bit of compost or humic substances or whatever, some carbon source, or if you're going to mix it in with chicken manure or whatever, that's an excellent way to add that sulfur onto a carbon component and lock it, or not lock it up, but uh, hold it there in a stable form for the plants to use later. So that's gonna increase the efficiency of our sulfur applications. So that's kind of what we're thinking first, how do we actually fix the soil environment with a sulfur application uh, before moving on to uh, foliar applications? Because the problem with foliar applications with sulfur is that it tends to be a really big pain if you can add calcium. So in 
a folate application, if you add calcium, what happens is that calcium then locks up with the sulfur and forms gypsum within your tank. Um, so you don't really want that because it creates a bit of a slurry. So if you can get out of a uh, folate application of sulfur, that's, that's a good idea. And so to do that, you need to be really focusing on your sulfur applications uh, pre-season. So say with, with the sulfur to your soil. So adding a carbon component to your soil applications of sulfur is a great, great way to do it. And then of course, we're going to be applying uh, foliar sulfur if required. And that's, that's typically we're gonna be doing that with nitrogen. You don't really need sulfur except for metabolizing nitrogen into amino acids. So if we don't really have a high amount of nitrogen that we need to convert, we don't really need to be applying that much sulfur. So I've seen situations where um, ammonium is a thousand parts per million in the plant, which is crazy. Like it, it, that should be really towards, trying to get that towards say under 50, really as far as we can towards zero. So a thousand parts per million of, of ammonium is terrible for the crop. In that case, we might need to apply some sulfur, but it's only because we're, we need to convert that nitrogen. In terms of uh, bigger thinking, what we need to be doing is building up our soil organic matter reserve. The best way to do that is with cover crops. So building up soil organic matter. The best way to do that is with cover crops, is with things that produce root extradates and pump them into the soil. So cover crops, as well as transitioning a farm to uh, these bigger picture things like pasture cropping or adding in say a grass phase, really beneficial to increasing your soil organic matter to then hold on to some of that sulfur. Because there is a certain amount of elemental sulfur in your parent material, uh, but really that's going to be a very slow release over time. Cool, so today was a quick one. Um, sulfur management really comes down to increasing the amount of carbon components within your soil. This is typically gonna be uh, more of a problem in sandy soils, so think Western Australia. That's gonna be a big problem. Likewise, if you have high rainfall in your crops, that's gonna be quite a problem, or if you're, if you're dealing with legumes and brassicas. But overall, increasing the amount of carbon, so carbon, sulfur, and nitrogen is a big uh, component of this, making sure you're adding carbon to your sulfur applications to hold that sulfur onto the carbon, quite beneficial. Likewise, building up your, your soil organic matter reserves. There's one more thing I didn't mention, and it's kind of in the fertilizer section, and that's actually relying on microbes to deliver sulfur to your plants through the rhizophagy cycle. And so the microbes can actually deliver cysteine and methionine to the plants through the rhizophagy cycle. And if you haven't heard of that before, go check out the video um, talking about the implications of the rhizophagy cycle in feeding our plants. If any of this is uh, of interest to you and increasing the quality of our plants, reducing the amount of pest and disease we have uh, through things like managing our sulfur in a regenerative way, make sure to reach out. We offer a free introductory 30 minute consultation uh, where we can go over your operation and talk about how we can start to move your system towards a regenerative uh, way. Awesome, thanks again for watching. My name's Steel, cheers.